Let's continue our discussion of blood and look at blood grouping or blood typing as you most commonly hear it called. Before we get into the different blood types, let's first look at some terms you often hear associated with this. The first one is transfusion. If someone is receiving a transfusion, they're receiving blood or some part of it. Maybe it's all the blood, just the reds, just the platelets, just the plasma, whatever. If it's some part of the blood, they're receiving a transfusion. If they're receiving something being introduced into the body other than blood, then that's an infusion. So most people have undoubtedly had lots of infusions before, but of course transfusions probably not. But when we talk about blood grouping or blood typing, we we'll always want to look at two different things, antigens, and right down here you see antibodies. Now the antigens in this case are going to be proteins found on the surface of red blood cells. And that's how our red blood cells are identified. <clears throat> when you get into other chapters like on the lymphatic system, you're going to see that antigens take on a very different meaning. But in this chapter here, when you hear antigens, you think about proteins on the surface of the red blood cells. This is how we've identified the different red blood cell types that you'll hear about. Floating around in the plasma part of the blood will be antibodies. We'll see where these antibodies come from, different types of white blood cells. Uh, they're called actually B plasma cells. We'll see that in another chapter. But whenever you look at the antigens in somebody's blood type, you'll see that the antibodies they possess never match up. If the antibodies and the antigens matched up, you'd be destroying your own red blood cells. Because if those antibodies ever find the protein that they're particular to, they'll destroy those cells. In this case, that would cause a lysing or a rupturing of those red blood cells. So obviously you don't wanna be destroying your own red blood cells. And these antibodies aren't always there. They're gonna come about later in your life, not too long after you've been born, after you get exposed to the antigens. That doesn't mean you're getting exposed to somebody else's red blood cells because these proteins can be found in other places, like bacteria, food, or whatever. But with blood grouping and blood typing, we always want to look at these groups, ABO. You may have heard of this ABO system, and then the RH factor, something else that's added to it. So look at these major blood types. There's somewhere around 35 blood types known worldwide, but most everybody's going to fall into the type A, B, AB, or O. Now this is very simple. If someone has type A blood, it's because their red blood cells have the A antigen proteins on their surface. If they have B blood, they have a different protein, just simply named the B antigen. If they are AB, they have both, and if they're type O, they have neither. So type and antigens, you can see, go hand in hand, except for the O right there, that means neither one of them. And if you know what antigens someone has in their blood, notice how the antibodies are always the opposite. Again, if you have A antigens, you would not want to make anti-A antibodies. That would destroy your own red blood cells. So that's why if you know antigen type, notice how antibodies always opposite. So if you have A blood and A antigens, you should only be making anti-B antibodies. If you have the B antigens, notice it's opposite, you'll be making anti-A. If you have both A and B, and you can't make either of those antibodies, either one of them would destroy your reds. And again, with the O, where you have neither of the antigens, you have both antibodies. So notice how those two are always opposite. And when you look at the major blood types, O, A, B, A, B, and so on here, you can see the common percentages. Every population you look at would be just a little different, but type O does seem to be the most common blood type. A is not far behind it. Notice A O is 47, A is 41. Type B is a lot rarer, only accounting for 9% of the population. And then A B, a lot rarer with 3%. But something else you can add to this A B, A B, and O is some, something else, another antigen called the D antigen, more commonly called the RH factor. Notice that most of the population, 85%, does have it. And if they have it, that's what gives them a positive on their blood type. If they don't have it, they have a negative. So say you check somebody's blood and you found the A antigen, the B antigen, and the D. Well, they'd be A, B positive. If you found none of those three, they didn't have A, B, or the D. Well, if they don't have A, B, they have to be 
O. And if they don't have this D, they'd be O negative. So again, you're really just looking for A, B, and D. Those antigens are going to tell you somebody's blood type. So think about what the most common blood type would be and why. We've already seen that O is the most common. Since 85% of the population has the Rh factor, O positive would be the most common. Think about which would be the least common. Notice how AB is only 3%. And again, since most people have the D antigen, well, other than that, the least common would be negative. AB negative would be the least common type. When you hear about universal donors and recipients, technically there's no such thing. You have to centrifuge blood for that to be possible. But think about how you could make O negative blood the universal donor. If you wanted to give O negative blood to any other blood type, say somebody with AB or AB right here, you wouldn't have any problem giving the reds because, again, consider if you're giving O negative blood, O tells you they don't have the A or B antigen, and the negative tells you they don't have the D. So you could give O negative red blood cells to any other blood type. There's nothing on these red blood cells for an antibody to react with, but you definitely would not want to give O plasma to any other blood type. Since the O plasma has both the antibodies, that would react with any other blood type. So again, O negative is only a universal donor if you centrifuge. In other words, spin the blood and separate the cells from the plasma and remove that plasma. That's where the antibodies are found. If you think about a universal recipient, we'll think about AB positive. If they're AB positive, well, now they're the opposite of O negative. They have the AB and the D antigen. And if they have all those antigens, well, they're not going to possess any of the antibodies that would react with them. So again, you could really consider that a universal recipient without the antibodies. They wouldn't have anything to react with any of the other antigens coming in. But again, you really need to centrifuge all this blood and separate. Another term we want to look at, hematocrit, is it's not just a number. It is always going to be a percent. It is the percent that red blood cells make of your total blood volume. And that should be somewhere around 45%. Remember we said for formed elements in another video, formed elements, the cells of the blood should be around 45%. Well, since almost all the formed elements are reds, the hematocrit should be around 45. And you don't want that percent to be too high or too low. If it's too low, there's not enough reds in the blood. It's going to give inadequate oxygen delivery. If the hematocrit is too high and there's too many reds, blood could be too thick. And the heart would not like that because it's more difficult to pump something which is thicker. If you look down here at the bottom, you can see these terms erythrocytosis and erythropenia. Remember, erythro always refers to the reds, leuco for the white blood cells and thrombo for the platelets. You see any of these cell names with cytosis on the end, it means there's too many of those. You see any of those cell names with pina on the end, then there's too few. You could say two low numbers, low hematocrit, either way you wanted to look at it right there. But looking back at that RH factor, that D antigen, it gets that RH because it was first found in the rhesus monkey. Proteins can be found in other things, animals, plants, whatever that may be, just depends on what the antigen is. But as we said before, about 85% of the population does have this protein on the surface of the reds, and about 15% doesn't. But down below it, where you see this hemolytic disease of the newborn, also called erythroblastosis fetalis, this is another case in which a mixing of blood types could be a big problem. Now, a common misconception is that mother and baby have to be of the same blood type. Absolutely not. There is a barrier called the placenta that keeps those blood cells separated. Now, ordinarily, there's not any mixing of the blood cells. Other things in the blood obviously do, but not the cells. But let's say the baby were to be Rh positive and the mother negative. Think about what you've got here. The baby has a protein that the mother doesn't. And if there were to be a mixing of the blood types, could be possible, usually doesn't happen, but could, then the mother <clears throat> is going to get exposed to a protein which is foreign to her body. 
Anytime you get exposed to foreign proteins, you make antibodies to destroy them. So if the baby, it's not the opposite, but when the baby has a protein that the mother doesn't, right? Baby's positive, mother's negative. If there were a mixing of the blood types, she'd make antibodies. And those antibodies can cross that placental barrier. They would cross that barrier over to the baby's blood, destroy the baby's red blood cells, and could even cause death right there. But if this were to be at risk, there's a nice little drug called Rogam, which can prevent this from happening. So hemolytic disease, the newborn, just another time in which there could possibly be mixing of the blood types. So there's your information on your blood typing.